Hi, I'm Brandon Brona, and this is yet another episode of The Transition Expert. For those of you who are just tuning in and just getting familiar with this show, this show is all about working with clients that are going through an anomaly of change. Today's guest is two. We have Michael Casey and his good friend, Al. Michael, Al, welcome. Hello, sir. So I got a call, uh, a concern call uh, today earlier uh, from Michael uh, concerning his friend. And I just wanted to get your perspective as to you know what's going on, what happened recently that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I mean, basically, he's just got a lot of stuff stored, you know, and I feel like uh, the stuff that he's storing is more like, uh, you know, his comfort. You know, the stuff that he has is his comfort. You know, and, and a lot of that stuff is, uh, to me, you know, just stuff that needs to go in the trash, you know. Okay. How long have you guys been friends? I would probably say about 10 years. Okay. How did two, how did the two of you guys meet? He was my landlord at one time. Interesting. Okay. And you guys just took a liking to one another? Yes, sir. Okay. And Al sounds like he's a great guy, huh? <laughs> Yeah, he, he is an awesome guy. I do I do love him a lot and care about him, and that's why we are here today. When did you first realize that Al, you know, has some some extra things going on in his home? I mean, just wearing the same clothes, you know, just he's he's got a lot of those hoarding hoarding factors, you know, uh, kitchen table filled up with a bunch of stuff, or uh, in the garage, you know, his garage is just piled high, all the shelving and everything is just as high as it can possibly be, you know, uh, just no room to really do anything. There's just stuff all over the place, you know, five or five or six lawnmowers, bicycles, cars, you know, cars that don't run, but they're, you know, used as a storage, you know, just stuff piled on top of them. And, you know, to start new, uh, a new fresh, he just retired, you know, so he's got time now, a little bit more time than what he normally had. So I just like him to, you know, start working on those challenges, which I'm his good friend and I'll be there to help him if he'll let me. Okay. Now, um, do you spend much time in, in his home or do you visit Al typically in your own place? Uh, he usually comes over to my house, but I mean, I have been over to his house a time or two, but I, he's never let me inside, you know, only whenever I've, I've been able to see what I could see when he opens the door real quick. But I mean, I peeked my head into the windows and stuff like that, you know, and there's refrigerators and bicycles and dishwashers and, you know, all this type of stuff, you know, s- saved or hoarded or stored. Mm-hmm. Was this the first time you've ever experienced anybody that, that had hoarding in- issues? Yes. How does Al react when you preface the conversation of doing something about the, the, the clutter and the items? Like most typical hoarders do, you know, that uh, he'll be able to get to it at some point in time. You know, that, uh, you know, everything has its place, you know, and it's time that he'll get to. But I feel like some things that he's had there, you know, haven't been touched for like 10 or 15 years. And so what do you want for Al? Well, I mean, in a perfect situation, what do you want for him? Get rid of the hoarding and and uh, the, the needless stuff that Al just doesn't need, you know, at this point in his life at 65. So you want the best for Al. He's a good friend of yours. You care deeply about him. You want to see him happy. And you know that this hoarding has, has really created a huge wedge in his personal life, correct? Yes, sir. All right. Well, you know that you're a good friend, and Al, you're very fortunate to have Michael as a good as a, as, a, as a buddy. I work with a lot of hoarding situations, and let me tell you, the support base is isn't always as good. And in fact, a lot of times, my clients that deal with the hoarding tendencies have a lot of issues with the shame and the judgment of others, which is why these situations stay going on for so long because they really don't have the outlet that they need in order to feel comfortable with getting help because they're afraid that the person's going to judge them, ostracize them, or alienate them. The reason this platform was created was to educate um, the support base, to be more empathetic, to be more compassionate, more understanding, and be patient um, with the hoarding tendencies. And I got to tell you, Mike, you got that part down packed, buddy, because I get the calls from the concerned people in these individuals' lives that are suffering from hoarding, and they're not always compassionate. They get on the phone and they're very judgmental. They tend to be very... Um, astute and very harsh with some of the language and the words that they use to the point where I have to redirect them to a much more um, compassionate way of dealing with it. So kudos to you because you called in and Al, he called in and said, listen, I got a good friend of mine. I'm really concerned about him. Uh, I want the best from him. I know he needs help. 
um, but he doesn't really have anywhere to turn. So he came to us purely to get help for you. So at this point, Al, I want to give you an opportunity to, to, to sort of give your version of, of the events and what's going on with you. When did you start the, the hoarding tendencies? Well, what the old saying that uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So, so you're a collector? Yeah. Okay. All right. What do you? I don't. I don't collect old newspapers. I don't collect empty pizza boxes. Okay. What do you collect? Uh, cars. Cars. Do you find yourself yeah. keeping a lot of car parts to fix those cars that need to be fixed? Yeah. If it's got value, I won't throw it away. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And so, do you often see that you have? So, Mike, does does Al have like uh, parts cars in in his areas? Yeah, he's got uh, two cars in his garages and uh, gar uh, cars around the area that, you know, that he just stores a bunch of stuff on them. You know, they're just like cars that he hasn't really probably touched in about 20 years. But, you know, they're the like the main pieces in his garage, but there's just stuff all stored all over them, nuts and bolts and parts and, mm -hmm. you know, just just hoard, hoarding stuff. I've worked with quite a few people in similar situations as you out. Um, that are mechanics, you know, they're, you know, these are, these are gearheads that, that work on a number of different cars and they have the, the cars, but then they have two elements that usually run them into situations or they run into problems with, where they have these cars that necessarily aren't running that they use for pieces so that they can donor. put into another car. Donor, donor, and, donor car. Is what yeah. Know. And then they, and then they have the unfinished projects. These are one or two cars, maybe more that they're starting to work on, but they never ever finish. And, you know, these are the issues that they run into with their wives or you know, their family when they're like, look, we can't park our cars in the driveway because you have this car here, that car there. Now, um, you don't consider yourself a hoarder. And trust me, you don't have to consider yourself a hoarder. What we care more about than anything is how any of these things have sort of created a wedge or interfered with any of your your personal life, you know, and I understand from talking to to Michael that you have you have a girlfriend that you've been wanting to sort of settle down with and commit with. How does she feel about spending time in your house? She doesn't like it. That's she doesn't good. like it. Yeah. Now, do you does that mean enough to you to make you feel that maybe I can do something differently to make her feel more comfortable yeah. inside the house? Yeah. Okay. In in the past, I didn't really have the time or took the time. Uh, working. Does it feel embarrassing to have people in, in the home the way it is? I would say probably yes. Okay. And well, I mean, and you would agree that you don't want, you would much rather not have that feeling, right? It'd be nice to have not have that feeling. Yes. It'd be nice. Okay. All right. So do you think that it'd be difficult for you to make decisions on getting rid of things in the home? Or does everything in the house you think have a purpose and is important to you? No, I, I, when the time comes to throw it away, I won't have a problem. Okay. All right. So on a scale of one to 10, do you think things need to come out of the house? Would you say you can get rid of 60%, maybe 50% or 70% of the content? Well, that is a very big house. How big is the house? I mean, how many square feet? 2,800. 2,800. Now, but, do you... So I, you I, so I use it as a storage unit. You can call it a storage unit. Okay. I'm too cheap to go buy a storage unit to pay a monthly storage fee. So I got empty bedrooms, a dining room I don't use. So it, you know. You filled it up. Did you fill it up? Yeah. And he also. A storage, a storage unit. Yeah. Like, like he'd fill up a storage unit. And he also okay. has other homes as well. Probably like four to five, four houses that I know of that also have things hoarded in them as well in the now, attic, in the house that are not rented out or anything. So would you say you use those houses, Al, as storage? The empty ones? Uh, <laughs> come on, Al. Give me, no, come on, I mean, give me a fair I'm one. I'm, I'm working on them, so the, the stuff that's there is construction related. Now, Al, listen, this is, let me rephrase this again. This is the non-judgmental zone. I'm only here to help. I really want to make a difference to what we can do to change things around. So just being open with me is only going to allow me to help you more. Um, but you have four, maybe how many houses that you that you're currently using to keep things in? How many would you say? One one main house. I got three empty houses. I'm, I got one house that I work out of. 
So that's that's where all my equipment is and material. That's the hub. That's the hub. Okay. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. It's it's the last one that I will rent out. And then from there, I, I'm working on the other two. Or basically, I'm working on one. The other one hasn't really been touched yet. It's vacant, and uh, and I haven't done anything to it yet. But the house that I'm working on now, almost done. There's not a lot of stuff there, but it's all construction related. So how many houses would you say in, in total, Al? Just give me a, a roundabout number. Is it three houses that you got some things in there that you're holding some, some content in? Well, it depends what you call content. Like I say, right. she rock, of, she rock. Yeah. <laughs> Construction materials. Yeah. I yeah. Two so by, two by fours. I won't throw two by four away because I don't need it anymore. I won't throw it away. I'll store it. So and, just, I need to get a roundabout number. How many houses are, are, would you say are, are potentially storage houses. I'm going to say one. The other two houses, I, if, if I wanted to, if I, if, if they were uh, fixed, you can rent them out, and it, it wouldn't it wouldn't take much to to get the crap out of there, whatever's there, and 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 show it and rent. And they've been I, vacant for quite a long time, though. How long have you been vacant, Michael? I would say uh, at least. Three, three years at minimal. I mean, three to four to five years, I would say around in there. No, it's uh, the longest one is probably going on three years. Okay. Now, how many what? houses do you own now? My, Al, how many homes do you own? Uh, five rooms in the house I live in. Okay. Now, are you maximizing your rent on all these houses? I mean, they're empty. And, I, and it's not. <laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> I'm not, and I'm not in a big hurry to, to run them out. Now is now a time to get those places back I, renting, I wouldn't agree. you agree? And I, and I will. Like I said, I've been working on them. And the, the plan is I'm going to rent them out. Uh, let me tell you this. During the pandemic, I saw a lot of different things happen with people. Um, anyone that was anything became more of what they were during the pandemic. And a lot of it gave them the ability to operate in the state of avoidance. Uh, in this situation, you know, we've already acknowledged that the hub, the hub of everything that you're going through, which is your main living uh, environment, isn't intended to be a warehouse. It's not intended to be a storage at all. It's intended to be a place for you to live, to enjoy your life, to invite people over like your good friend Mike and to have your girlfriend who you've been with for quite some time potentially spend more time with you. Who knows, maybe get married someday in the near future. But for at least now, be able to spend a little bit more time in that home, I know it's gonna just improve your overall well-being. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Okay. All right, finally. Thank finally we got you to agree. Well, one thing, Al, you're you're a tight, you're a hard one, man. <laughs> it's hard to get those vows about you, but yeah, I know when you say it, your yeses are your yeses, and your noes are your noes. And I and I, I can respect the man in that that situation. Let me ask you a question. Do you do you have any fears centered around money or about anything about losing something well, as far as money goes we're running out of it okay and what is it what do you think what's the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the possibility of having some money shortages uh, possibility when i say running out of money i'm talking you know having to live under a bridge it's kind of so funny. living under a bridge <laughs> is that the worst thing you think get it that? that way yes and then, and then, and thinking that man, if I had uh, had pissed away that money that uh, that I had, then I wouldn't be in a situation today. Okay. So instead of instead of spending it on whatever, I saved it. Okay. But he well, is think- retired though now, and he is a veteran. You know, he's been working with uh, an airline company for thirty years, and so you know his retirement is good. You know, and he, uh, you know, he has money to buy clothes and you know, live, live a life of not having to worry about those things. But, you know, he, he wears the same clothes. And the only reason that he's wearing this hat is because I gave it to him a long time ago. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he uh, will not buy new clothes, uh, new shoes. I mean, I beg him to get some good shoes for his feet. So then that way his uh, back doesn't hurt, you know, and uh, just posturing, you know, just shoes with tape on them and, you know, what? stuff like that. How how say it ain't so. You're not walking around with tape on your shoes, are you? All my work boots, soles. Uh, my so a little, duct, little duct tape on there, and they're good to go for another six months. So, so let me get this right. Al, you have a you have a, a use it up, wear it out, or do without. 
<laughs> so let me get this right out. You have a wonderful girlfriend. She she's smitten by you. Obviously, she's been with you for a very long time, and you're you're frugal and you're very you know very very strategic, if you will, with your money. Um, but she's still hanging in there with you. You must be a hell of a guy. You must a be thread. a hell of a guy. Yeah, she's he he's on a thread and he knows it and she knows it and you know hopefully this will you know keep their bond together and keep it going you know because he is here today and he is trying to make that change i hope you know so i feel like maybe this initiation might be the start of good things in everybody's life so happy girlfriend happy wife equals happy life the happier you can make her and i'm sure mike you would attest to this the happier you can make her i'm sure in return she's going to make you an even happier man so Getting that place together is about situating and establishing a foundation predicated off of commitment and caring and making compromises and doing all the things that don't always make you happy, but it all but it often makes the person you're what happy because you care about them. You're a man of few words. You don't you're not really the one to to express yourself through words. Your love language may be totally different. All we know your love language may be. You change her oil or something like that, you know, <laughs> or change the Very tires true. of the car. Very um, true. Whatever the thing may be, her love language might be entirely different. And getting that place together will allow, will open up the possibilities for other avenues and other aspects of your relationship to grow stronger. And and that's what we want to do. We want to offer you the ability and the opportunity to improve your your way of living in such a way that would welcome the possibility of a better relationship, not just with her, but with your good friend, Mike, your family, and most importantly, with yourself. Because I feel like if we can get this place together, who knows what's next? It can create a domino effect of positivity of other areas in your life where you now you know, start working out more, you start eating healthier, you start doing all these other things that this platform was designed to do as a transition company to sort of help people move forward in a healthier way of living. I like to schedule an in-home evaluation assessment um, to, to get out to your property, to do a tour, to look at what's going on over there um, and sort of get an idea as to how we can put things in motion and also look at those other places. We don't want to just do the hub and then your suggestion while doing the hub is let's just move all these over to the other house. Let's move this to that house. No, we're not doing that. We're going to go right at this problem. And the only way to get through anything is to go through it. And it's going to be difficult because you're going to start seeing as we peel away that emotional onion, um, all the things that you've done to yourself that we need to undo. You know, it's to really understand you as a person. We have to understand why you do what you do in terms of the things that you keep, where you keep them, why you keep them and how you keep them. So that systematically, we don't just fix the problem, but we create a system in place that can offer you the ability to maintain it because sustainability is the most important thing. Otherwise, we're going to throw good money and bad money and we're going to waste good effort on poor results. So my hopes are that we can figure out why you do these things psychologically and understand how emotionally we can get you vested into the process of moving, removing these things, figuring out how we can place things in a way so that you don't end up back in this situation or even worse. Right, Al? Yeah. All right. That's the goal. The goal is not just to do this, but to get your buy-in so that when we get to the to the championship, that you do all the things necessary to keep yourself there. And by that, I mean, if you got to get routine services to your house every week, every two weeks to do tidying up, to help you sort of keep things in, in place you're gonna be safer as a result of it. Because at this stage of your life, you've retired, you worked your job, you put all your money in the right place, you've got some you got some assets here, you've done the right thing, you've done what most Americans should do. You work your butt up, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you don't ask anybody for anything, you did it all on your own. Now is the time to enjoy it, right? Exactly. Right? <laughs> Let's give me some enthusiasm because I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. And, and I know Mike's excited for you, but I want you to be excited for yourself because why you deserve more and I want to give you more. Right. Right. Yes. Sir. All right. There we go. So was this powwow beneficial, Al? I think so. Yes, it was. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for you know coming on this show. Mike, you're, you're the salt of the earth. 
It's because of people like you, Mike, that I'm in a position to be able to help more people because you're the ones that say, hey, I know this person needs help. I know they're not going to do it, but I'm going to pick up the phone and do all the things for this person to help them. Just by talking to Al, listening to how he's responding and how he's not combative with you. You know, he's been real receptive. He's a good guy. He seems like a really good guy um, that you have a great relationship with him and he values you and he cares about you. Otherwise, he wouldn't have joined in on this on this call. For those of you who are tuning in at home that are watching this show that also have a friend or a family member like our good friend Mike has with Al, um, and you're worried about how you can get help, do it. Pick up the phone, contact Lifecycle, give the transition expert a phone call. We'll talk about what we need to do. We'll put the action steps in place. Don't just wait for the inevitable to happen. I want to take my hat off for you, Mike. I appreciate you from the bottom of my heart. Al, thank you again for being a part of this show. And again, if anyone's tuning in and wants help, needs help, and looking for help for themselves or their loved ones, please give us a call. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't postpone it. Procrastination is the assassin to all opportunity. Give us a call. Thank you again for another great episode of The Transition Expert. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're welcome.